This is the final video in the Metabolic Pathways series and today we're going to look at the integration of pathways and touch on some of the extra metabolic pathways that we haven't seen in the other six videos. So we're going to have a look at the Cori cycle, we'll look at what happens with glycogen, we'll look at gluconeogenesis and we'll touch on lipogenesis. I'm Professor Joanne Lind. So the learning outcome for um, this video is really it, it's summarising some of the other learning outcomes that we've already looked at. So we're going to explain the processes involved in carbohydrate metabolism in a healthy individual. But in doing that, we're going to touch on those pathways I just mentioned. Cori cycle, glycogenesis and glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis. But we'll also explain the processes involved in uh, fat metabolism in a healthy individual um, by just touching on lipogenesis. So the previous videos have um, touched on all the starred elements here in my metabolic map. So today we're going to um, focus on all the remaining sections that we haven't covered in the other uh, videos. We're going to have a look at how all these three macronutrient metabolic pathways get integrated together. So let's start with back to carbohydrate metabolism. We had a look in some of the early videos on how we um, take pyruvate and it can go through um, conversion to acetyl-CoA and then further oxidation via the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation if there's oxygen present. Now today what we're going to have a look at is what happens if oxygen is absent. So anaerobic metabolism of pyruvate to lactate and that is actually called the Cori cycle and it occurs in muscle cells when you've depleted all the oxygens within, oxygen within the muscle cells. So let's have a look at lactate production. So we know that muscles can consume a large amount of glucose, so via glycolysis, and in doing so they produce a large amount of pyruvate. So if you think back to the video on glycolysis, we know that glycolysis operates under anaerobic conditions, meaning that we do not require oxygen for glycolysis to occur. Now glycolysis is shown here in the image on the right hand side of the screen. It's just a series of reactions that ultimately gets from glucose down to pyruvate. Now if oxygen is present, that pyruvate will be converted to acetyl-CoA and enter the Krebs cycle and undergo oxidative phosphorylation, which um, produces the most amount of ATP, which is good for the cell. However, over time, oxygen is required for that process and oxygen becomes depleted in the muscle. So in vigorous exercise, whilst we will rely on glucose via glycolysis to pyruvate, acetyl-CoA into the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation, once the oxygen has been depleted, we need a means to use that pyruvate and still produce energy. Now we know through glycolysis that there's a net production of two ATP but we are also um, requiring a recycling of that pyruvate somehow. We need to harness the energy that's in that pyruvate without it going through to carbon dioxide and water. So cells have a limited amount of NAD+, and we know that NAD+, is converted to NADH during gly glycolysis. So we need a way to get the NADH back to NAD+, so that glycolysis becomes a, the form of energy production, so that net two ATP that are produced can continue to occur. So we need NAD plus for that to happen. Now, one way that that can occur is that we can convert pyruvate into lactate. And in converting pyruvate to lactate, we take the NADH that we've produced during glycolysis and we convert it back to NAD plus. In that way, the glycolysis can still occur and we can keep producing that net 2 ATP and lactate rather than having pyruvate be converted to acetyl-CoA. What happens then is that lactate can be salvaged via gluconeogenesis, which we'll look at in a minute. So while we do not get as much energy through the Cori cycle, we still do get energy because glycolysis in itself produces energy. So here's how the recycling process works. 
we have the Cori cycle. So in the muscle, we know it's undergoing glycolysis on the right-hand side, and it converts glucose to pyruvate. We can then convert pyruvate to lactate, which can then be transported in the blood back to the liver, where the lactate can be converted back to pyruvate and used um, in gluconeogenesis to create glucose. And we're going to look at gluconeogenesis now. So in active muscle, once it's depleted all its oxygen, the Cori cycle is what occurs, and it's lactate that is produced because it's um, a means of preserving the energy while still providing ATP for the muscle. So what we just looked at was um, pyruvate into lactic acid or lactate via the Cori cycle. Now let's have a look at gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis, genesis means generation and neo means new. So we're talking about the generation of new glucose. Now this is very important when the body is under um, underfed conditions or in a starved state or a fasted state. So we really only carry as little as one day supply of glucose, but we need to maintain blood glucose levels constantly at a level above four. So we know that muscles consume large amounts of glucose via glycolysis, and in doing that, they produce large amounts of pyruvate. We just talked about how under vigorous exercise, the muscle cells will convert that pyruvate into lactate. Now, gluconeogenesis is a pathway that salvages the pyruvate back from the lactate, as well as using other precursors that we've looked at in other videos. So it looks at the glycogen component of fats and some of the carbon skeletons from the breakdown of um, the amino acids. So let's have a look at gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is the pathway that's shown here on the right hand side, but rather than reading it from top to bottom as we would have if it was glycolysis, we're actually looking at it from the bottom up. So we've started with um, pyruvate or we might have started with oxaloacetate and we're going to use those precursors to produce glucose. Glycerol is another precursor for gluconeogenesis and it enters at the halfway point as shown. So the major precursors of gluconeogenesis are lactate, amino acids, so particularly the carbon skeletons from amino acids, and glycerol. Now gluconeogenesis occurs mainly in the liver and the kidneys can actually do a small amount of gluconeogenesis. And the purpose of gluconeogenesis is to maintain blood glucose levels. Now importantly, and it's circled here in green, is oxaloacetate. Now in the liver, this is like the switch. If oxaloacetate is being used for gluconeogenesis, then it cannot be used in the liver for the Krebs cycle. So it depends on what state the liver is in as to whether the liver is undergoing um, the production of energy via the Krebs cycle or whether it's undergoing gluconeogenesis to produce new glucose. So that's where the balance of pathways comes into it. So if we have glucose that's produced via gluconeogenesis in the liver and kidney, it's released into the bloodstream so that the glucose can be transported to other areas of the body that require the full metabolism of glucose. So this glucose it would be absorbed by the brain and heart and red blood cells and other um, tissues and organs. And in those other tissues and organs, oxaloacetate is available because the other organs can't undergo gluconeogenesis. So those other organs will then take up glucose and metabolize glucose via the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP energy. So it's only the glucose that can no longer undergo um, the Krebs cycle when the body is in a fasting state. So the pyruvate and lactate produced in other tissues um, when it's undergoing the Cori cycle is returned to the liver so that the liver can still use pyruvate to, to produce glucose. Now if you remember, once pyruvate has been converted to acetyl-CoA, it can't go back. So pyruvate is important for a recycling process because you want it as a precursor for glucose in gluconeogenesis. 
So we need substrates for this. And the, the um, purpose of gluconeogenesis is to maintain blood glucose levels so that the other tissues and organs in the body can use glucose as a form of energy to produce ATP via the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. So if we go back to our metabolic map here, we've now looked at gluconeogenesis. But what happens if we actually have excess glucose that we need to store? And we do that by storing it in the form of glycogen. So let's have a look at um, glycogen production, so glycogenesis, and also glycogen breakdown, which is glycogenolysis. So these two um, metabolic pathways are important because glycogen um, can be stored in the liver and in some muscle, and it's an immediate source of glucose. So to produce um, glycogen, it's the combining of glucose molecules, so adding them together to make glycogen. And that would happen when the body is in a well-fed state. So what activates um, glycogenesis, so the production of glycogen, is insulin. So we know insulin is released by the body when the blood sugar levels are high. So we know that there's lots of glucose available. And it's also activated after the Cori cycle. So um, if you've had the pyruvate being returned to the liver and you have excess pyruvate there and you're still in a well-fed state, then you know that you can convert that back into glucose and that glucose can be converted into glycogen for storage. Now this process occurs in the liver, but some of it may also occur in the muscle. So that's in a well-fed state. Once we've, we've got high blood glucose levels, we can store some of that glucose in the form of glycogen. The main store is the liver. However, we need to sometimes access, access those stores, and that's by breaking down the glycogen by glycogenolysis into glucose in both the muscle and the liver. So those glycogen stores aren't very big and they're depleted quite quickly, but it does provide an immediate source of glucose for both of those tissues. So the glucose in the liver can be used for um, gluconeogenesis. So um, it can be put out into the blood when gluconeogenesis is operating with the other um, products of gluconeogenesis, all producing glucose. It's put out into the bloodstream to maintain blood glucose levels. Um, we also know that it's used as a source of glucose in the muscle when we quickly need um, energy in our muscles. So glyco glycogenol glycogenolysis is a way of accessing our energy stores. Now, after we've been in a fasted state for quite a while, and then we start eating, so we're starting to boost our blood sugar levels and increase our glucose, the first thing that actually happens in the liver before we switch off um, gluconeogenesis is that we will actually replenish our glycogen stores before we then start breaking down the glucose. So when we first eat after breaking a fast, the first thing that happens is actually we continue under gluconeogenesis until we've uh, replenished all our glycogen stores. And once our glycogen stores have been replenished, then we'll start using the glucose that is available to us as a form of energy. So you've seen this slide before, but it, it starts to integrate the different pathways. So um, we've talked about creating glycogen stores. We've talked about how we need to maintain blood glucose levels. Um, and in the fatty acid metabolism video, we looked at the production of um, ketone bodies as a, also a source of energy in a fasted state. Now, one of the key molecules in all of this is acetyl-CoA in the liver. So that we know that one acetyl-CoA molecule is produced from every two carbons on a fatty acid chain. So in most tissues, this is able to enter the Krebs cycle to produce ATP. Um, but in the liver, we know that if gluconeogenesis is operating, then we can't undergo um, the Krebs cycle in the liver. So, and, and that's because the oxaloacetate in the liver is being used 
for gluconeogenesis. So when we're in a fasted state is actually when fat breakdown dominates. So where do we get our energy from if we're in a fasted state? We actually get it from our fat stores. So our fat is broken down, but the oxaloacetate is shunted away for gluconeogenesis. So we're left with in the liver with acetyl-CoA that cannot undergo the Krebs cycle in the liver. And that is when the body switches to ketogenesis. So in a fasting state, the liver will be undergoing ketogenesis to produce ketone bodies, which can then be transported around the body. So not only are we maintaining the minimum blood glucose level, but we're also giving energy off to other tissues in the form of um, ketone bodies, which is a transportable form of acetyl-CoA. So all these pathways need to be integrated and what's happening in the liver isn't necessarily what's happening in your muscle cells or your cardiac muscle cells. So glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are coordinated and it's tissue specific. So while the liver might be undergoing gluconeogenesis because we need to maintain blood sugar levels, muscle cells might be going through glycolysis and then the core recycle because we need to have energy still produced in those cells. Similarly, the cardiac cells, I've said previously, they like ketone bodies, so they like um, acetyl-CoA, which can go through the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. Now this image here actually shows you that some of the lactate that's produced from the Cori cycle might be used in cardiac muscle to enter the Krebs cycle, and blood glucose also might be used by cardiac muscles. So what's happening in the liver, if it's gluconeogenesis, isn't necessarily what's happening in the muscle cells, which is glycolysis. And that depends if you're in a well-fed state or in a uh, um, starved state, so a fasting state. So the other thing to talk about if we're in that really well-fed state and we've taken in a lot of um, fats and proteins and carbohydrates, we know the fats can go directly to fat storage, so we don't need to break them down if we're in a well-fed state. But what happens to the other things if we're in a well-fed state? And ultimately, we can create new fats via lipogenesis to um, store excess fat. And how we can do that is that we can, can take up glucose into um, the cell, and that glucose can be converted via glycolysis, which is the left-hand pathway of that image. And through glycolysis, we make pyruvate. Now that pyruvate enters into the mitochondria, and if we're in a well-fed state, we're not on undergoing gluconeogenesis, so the Krebs cycle is available for us, therefore we can produce acetyl-CoA. Now, once we've produced acetyl-CoA, it combines with oxaloacetate to produce citrate. That's the first step in the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Now that citrate can then also be exported from the mitochondria back into the cytosol and converted back into acetyl-CoA in the cytosol and goes through a number of steps. Now you don't need to know all the different steps, but it can be converted into fatty acyl-CoA. Once it's done that, it can be combined with glycerol, which can be also produced in a well-fed state. And glycerol combining with three fatty acids makes triglycerides. Now, that's in the liver cell. Those triglycerides can then be exported out of the liver and into fat storage, so into adipocyte cells. So in a well-fed state, while if you, you may not have a high fat diet, you may have a high sugar diet, you will still produce fat for storage because the acetyl-CoA that is the byproduct of metabolizing the glucose through pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, it can then be converted to first citrate and then ultimately triglycerides, which can be stored as fat. So similarly, if you have excess protein, the carbon skeletons that you have in excess can enter the um, Krebs cycle and go around to the point of citrate, which can then be used as a form to produce extra fats. So you will then have 
an increase in fat storage if we have excess um, carbohydrates or proteins in our diet. You'll also have fat storage if you have extra fats in your diet, but we don't need to create the fats in that case. We have the fat already, we just push it directly into storage. So now we've actually covered all of our points in this metabolic map. So over the seven videos, hopefully you understand the different processes and what would happen under a well-fed state. So you would go, your metabolism would take carbohydrates and send them all the way through to the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. In a well-fed state, your fats would stay in storage. And in a well-fed state, any excess protein um, that's not used for protein synthesis, we need to break that down, not, no matter what state we're in. So the urea cycle will excrete the urea and the um, carbon skeletons will be used in the Krebs cycle. We will also be storing glycogen if we're in a well-fed state. If we're in a, a fasting state or a starved state, then we need to maintain blood glucose levels. So that's when gluconeogenesis would be operating. That's when ketogenesis would be operating. Um, but in different tissues, we still will be undergoing the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain because it's the tissues that require the energy that need those um, processes to operate. However, in the liver, we wouldn't be undergoing the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain if gluconeogenesis is operating. And finally, we can actually store excess fats in a well-fed state. Um, if we get down to acetyl-CoA, that can be used as a precursor through citrate to produce um, excess triglycerides, which we would put into storage for later use. So in summary, we know that under anaerobic conditions, glucose is metabolized by the Cori cycle in the muscle once we've used up all the oxygen. We know that glycogen can be stored in the muscle and liver and it's available for immediate use so we can create glycogen and we can break it down again. We must maintain our blood glucose levels at all time and we do that via gluconeogenesis. And we know that when blood glucose level is low, the liver will not undergo the Krebs cycle because oxaloacetate is being used in gluconeogenesis. But other tissues, once we've um, exported the blood glucose out in the blood to the other tissues, they can undergo the Krebs cycle when blood glucose is low because they still have oxaloacetate. It's only in the liver that is and a little bit in the kidney where gluconeogenesis is operating. And we know that if there's excess energy available, the body will undergo lipogenesis, so it will create excess fat for storage, even if the diet hasn't got a lot of fat in it. You can just have a lot of protein and carbohydrates in your diet. You will still lead to um, fat storage via lipogenesis. So that completes my um, series of videos on metabolism. There's a few extra animations there that you might want to revise for the content of this video and please contact me if you have any questions. Thank you.